It's great to be back with you guys tonight, and we're going to continue our study of heaven. You might say that lesson one and now lesson two are preliminary lessons in a way. I felt like it was important to have a lesson that set forth how the story of the Bible began so that we can appreciate more how the story of the Bible ends. After all, as, as you already know, but as we will see, um, the way the story of the Bible ends, the way that heaven is described for us, is very much in terms of and evocative of uh, what we read about at the start of the Bible story. And then this lesson is also, you might say, um, a preliminary lesson in the sense that if we're going to talk about where we are going, then we need to understand a little bit more about what we will be like, where we are going. And that's what this lesson is designed to do. Um, we know that the Bible teaches that God created us as human beings uh, with a nature that is on the one hand an outer nature or a flesh and blood nature or a bodily nature. And on the other hand, there is an inner nature nature to us. Sometimes the Bible uses the word spirit. Sometimes it re uses the word soul to refer to this inward dimension of who we are. <clears throat> and the scriptures also teach that one way to think about what death is, is that death is when that inner and outer nature are separated from one another. James says in James chapter 2, that as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what it is to be a living human being, as God intended, was to have a body. Uh, we are uh, bodies and souls together. And death separates that, but death is not going to be the end of the story. The Bible says a lot about a new glorified bodily existence called the resurrection. And normally, when I do lessons, I like to pick a few passages and really focus on them. But every now and then, I think that there is a teaching that has been neglected that um, is good to just machine gun a bunch of verses. And I think this is one of those teachings. My experience has been, not only in my early life as a Christian, but also in my preaching and teaching, that... Uh, many Christians are unclear or uncertain about the biblical teaching regarding the resurrection. So what I'm going to do tonight, as long as my voice will hold up, all the coughing I've been doing has, has kind of wreaked havoc with my voice, but as much as I can, I want to just go through a ton of passages to talk about the resurrection. So this will be like Bible drill night. Get your Bible out. We're going to start in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 20. And we're just going to zoom through a ton of passages on the doctrine of the resurrection. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have a record of the same event toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry when he goes into the temple area and takes on all comers of the Jewish schools of religious thought, including the Sadducees. And Luke's account is what I want to focus on. It says in Luke 20, verse 27, there came to him some Sadducees, and then Luke explains for us, those who deny that there is a resurrection. The Pharisees, of course, believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Sometimes this is called leveret marriage, which comes from the Latin word for brother-in-law, and it is something that was taught in the law of Moses. Now, they present a scenario to Jesus in which there are seven brothers. One of the men dies. His wife does not have children, so she ends up marrying all six of his brothers, all of whom pass away. Now, they present this as if it actually happened. Um, it's hard to imagine, if for no other reason, human nature being what it is, if I was, you know, brother number four, I would say, you know, I'm just going to take a pass. But in any event, they present this situation to Jesus and ask them the question in verse 33, in the, resurre in the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. Now, <clears throat> there's one basic assumption the Sadducees are making in this question that we're going to see Jesus react to. And that assumption is that 
the resurrection life is going to be exactly like this life. And in the resurrection life, they are all going to still want to marry her. And so there's going to be this big brawl in heaven in the resurrection between these seven brothers and the one bride. This isn't seven brides for seven brothers. This is one bride for seven brothers. So the key assumption here is that the resurrection is going to be just like this life. And that's what Jesus is going to to call them on. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. What Jesus is saying is, you are fundamentally mistaken in thinking that resurrection life is going to be just like life in the current age. In the resurrection, we will be transformed such that we will no longer be subject to death. And that's why Jesus makes the point that there won't be marriage in the resurrection. Remember, the the basis of this question by the Sadducees had to do with a practice in which a man died and left his widow with no children. And of course, the, there's several you know things going on there. One is who's going to care for the mother, or excuse me, for the for the widow. Secondly, what about his inheritance, which is supposed to be passed down through his children if he doesn't have any? But you see, both of those issues have to do with the fact of mortality in this life, the fact that we aren't going to live forever. Jesus' point in answering the Sadducees' question here is to say to them, in the resurrection, it will be a new kind of existence in which we are no longer subject to death. And so there won't be any need for a provision like what was found in the law of Moses. Now, there's more to that exchange, but that gets across a key point uh, to help us understand what Jesus teaches about the nature of the resurrection, which is what we're really focusing on here in this lesson. Now then, if you go to the Gospel of John, there's several occasions where Jesus mentions the concept of the resurrection. In John chapter 5, he says this in verse 28, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who've done good to the resurrection of life, those who've done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, in the discussion with the Sadducees, Jesus only alluded to those who were counted worthy to attain to the resurrection in a, in a positive sense. But here in John, we get a fuller picture, which is that everybody will be raised from the grave. They will be raised from the tomb and then assigned their final state on the basis of the judgment of Jesus himself. Later in chapter 6, Jesus says this in verse 44, John 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So here we get an additional bit of information that the resurrection will take place at the very end, on on the last day. Now then, one other passage just to make note of in the Gospel of John, before we move on to the book of Acts. Of course, Jesus didn't just teach the resurrection of the dead. He practiced it. You could say Jesus practiced what he preached. Because in the Gospels, he raises three different people from the dead. The most famous of those stories is probably the one here in John 11, when he raises Lazarus, even though Lazarus has been dead by the time he gets there for some time. I'll just call your attention to what Jesus says in his exchange with Lazarus's sister Martha, here in verse 23 of John 11. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Martha was a good student of Jesus. She had heard him teach what we just read in John 6, 44, that there will be a resurrection on the last day. But then Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And then, of course, Jesus raises Lazarus as a signpost to his own resurrection, and then, of course, ultimately to our resurrection. So that's a survey of some of the passages in the Gospels. Now, in the book of Acts, it is the Apostle Paul who says the most about our resurrection. Of course, all of the 
uh, preachers in the book of Acts are going to focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I wanted to just point you to a couple of places in the book of Acts where Paul talks about our resurrection. <clears throat> What's interesting, <clears throat> these all come in the context of Paul defending himself uh, in front of various tribunals. So in Acts chapter 23, Paul has... Uh, he, he's accosted by a mob when he gets to Jerusalem in Acts 21. He is arrested, and then he's presented before the Sanhedrin Council to defend himself in Acts 23. And it says this in verse 6. It's kind of funny, actually. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, who don't believe in the resurrection, and the other Pharisees, who did, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. And several times in Acts and in his letters, when Paul talks about his status before he became a Christian, he mentions the fact that he was a part of the sect of the Jews known as the Pharisees. And then he says, It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And this was a case of divide and conquer. Verse 7 says, When he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And then the Pharisees go on to say in verse 9, Hey, this, this guy sounds pretty good to us. So a little bit of divide and conquer. But what I wanted you to see here is that particularly on the doctrine of the resurrection, just like Jesus clearly sides with the Pharisees and says the Sadducees are, are wrong, Paul does as well here in Acts 23. If you go to chapter 24, Paul appears before the Roman governor, Felix, and makes a similar kind of statement in, about the resurrection. When it says in verse 14, This I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I want you to notice, by the way, how in both the previous passage and in this passage, Paul makes the point that the resurrection is intricately tied with our hope. And in the New Testament, it talks about hoping in God, hoping in heaven. But the most common thing the New Testament connects hope with is this very point, the hope of the resurrection. And then one more passage from the book of Acts, from one of Paul's defenses. This is in chapter 26, when Paul is before uh, the Jewish king Herod Agrippa II. In Acts 26, Paul says in verse 22, To this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying, both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now, this is not an explicit statement by Paul about the resurrection, but you can see it is an implicit one, right? Because he says that the Christ is the one who would be the first to rise from the dead, and the idea is the first of more to come. All right, now that's the Gospels and the book of Acts. <clears throat> the other main area of the New Testament we want to look at, of course, are the letters of the New Testament. And again, most of these are by the Apostle Paul. It's really going to be just one exception for a passage that explicitly talks about the resurrection. All right, so let's go over to Romans chapter 6. You hanging in there with me? Let me just pause here and, and take a drink just for a second. <clears throat> By the way, this is my Tampa Bay Lightning mug that Ralph Walker left at my apartment in Tampa 20 years ago this coming year. When I moved away, he came to help me move, and he said I didn't have to send it back to him. So for 20 years now, I have kept this, this mug. I have to say, not because I'm a big Lightning fan, <clears throat> but just because it's a big it's a big cup. I can get a lot of, a lot of water or Coke or whatever in there to drink. All right, so uh, Romans chapter 6. This, this chapter, of course, uh, begins with a very famous passage by Paul <clears throat> about the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and our union with Christ in, in baptism as we are put to death and then raised to life like he was. But what I want you to also see is that the concept of being raised to new life 
points to the ultimate resurrection to new life in this passage. So in Romans 6 verse 5, Paul says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. You see how Paul switches back and forth from what has happened in our own death to sin and resurrection spiritually to what will happen when we will be raised physically like Christ himself was raised. Now then, the chapter in Romans where Paul goes into more detail on this is chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. Verse 11, Paul says this, If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. This body is mortal and it will die, but God, through the Spirit, is going to give life once again to this mortal body. And then later in the same chapter, Romans 8, verse 23, he says, And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we eagerly wait, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. So a lot of times, I think when I think of redemption, I think of redemption in terms of being set free from my sins as a spiritual work of God. But what I want you to see here is that the Bible also talks about the redemption of our bodies. Remember, God created us to be embodied creatures. What it is to be a living human being is to have a body. Sin has an effect on our spirit, but it also has an effect on our body, right? It's because of sin, ultimately, that we are mortal. And what Scripture teaches is just as surely as we will be freed from our sins, redeemed from our sins, redeemed spiritually, there is a component of redemption that is yet to happen when we will be redeemed physically in the resurrection of the body. I remember one time years ago where I was preaching, when I was trying to convey this point, I said to the class, there's a sense in which you could say we are half redeemed, not in the sense that God has only forgiven half our sins, but in the sense that while we are redeemed inwardly or spiritually right now, we have a future redemption yet to take place with the other aspect of what we are, which is embodied creatures. And sure enough, there was somebody who misunderstood. I thought, did he say we're only half forgiven or only half saved? Well, that that wasn't the point. My point was for us to see that redemption is a now and a not yet kind of uh, proposition. We are redeemed now spiritually, but this mortal body will die, and this mortal body will be redeemed in the resurrection. All right, now, probably the most famous passage of all of Paul's on the subject is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I've done a lot of teaching um, in the time that I've been here at Valrico on this passage, so I don't want to just, you know, retread um, all the things that we talked about previously. I do want to point out just a couple of things here as we look at this passage. First of all, Paul says in verse 25, that Christ must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Think about that. It's an enemy to be destroyed. In other words, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about how the story of the Bible began was so that we understand that God's intention for his creation and for his creatures is not going to be thwarted by the devil. Ultimately, God intends to have the last word, and that has ramifications for the creation, and it has ramifications for the creature. If our mortal bodies died, and that was just the end of the story, and all the rest of our story was just going to be to float around, you know, like Casper the Friendly Ghost, that is, in essence, to give the devil the victory. 
But God is not going to do that. Death is an enemy. The rupture that takes place of the inner and outer dimension of what we are as human beings is a disorder from what God intends. And God intends to set it right. And that will happen at the resurrection. Now, another thing I want you to notice here in 1 Corinthians 15 is that apparently some of the people at Corinth had the same kinds of objections to the resurrection that the Sadducees did. How can this happen? What kind of body will it be? That's what Paul says in verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And Paul answers that question by saying, look all around you. You can see that God has the power to create many different kinds of creatures, many different kinds of bodies. So he mentions that there is, in verse 39, one kind of flesh for humans, another for birds, another for fish, for animals. There are heavenly bodies. God has the power to create a wonderful, amazing variety of kinds of things perfectly suited for their environment. Do you think that he won't have the power to do the same in the resurrection? Of course not. That's Paul's point that he makes here um, in, in the start of that second half of the chapter. The other point that Paul makes is that in the resurrection, there is going to be a new body for a new environment. Uh, and the way to think about this is to think in terms of an analogy of um, something that is planted and something that is grown. Verse 36, you foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. So think about um, a, rose, uh, a rose shrub and, and planting to, to have a rose bush. And what the seed looks like for that. Uh, I think one time in a sermon I showed you on PowerPoint, if you looked at that seed, you would have no idea that a beautiful rose would come from that. But a beautiful rose does. What goes in the ground is not what comes out of the ground. What comes out of the ground is connected to what went into the ground. I'm sorry, if you hadn't put the seed in the ground, the flower, the rose would not have come up, but it's so much greater. You would almost think there's no connection at all. That's the resurrection. God is going to transform us so that what goes into the, bot, to the ground, this mortal body, is going to be transformed in a way comparable to a rose being that much greater than the seed that goes into the ground. And then Paul gives us some of these wonderful descriptions. Verse 42, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. And I'm hoping that by now, uh, you know what I think Paul means when he says it is a spiritual body. That doesn't mean a body that's just like, you know, um, Obi-Wan Kenobi at the end of The Return of Jedi, you know, just some shimmering ghost. Um, when Paul uses the word spiritual here, he's using it in the same way that he does in chapter 10, when he says that when Israel was in the wilderness, they ate spiritual food and drink spiritual drink. Now, when Israel ate and drank in the wilderness, they ate quail and manna, tangible material food. But it was not provided by normal means. It was provided miraculously, supernaturally. And when they drank the water that came from the rock, it was real H2O, but it was not naturally provided. It was supernaturally provided by the Spirit. That's what it means to be spiritual food and spiritual drink. A spiritual body is a body, but it is not provided by the normal means of human procreation. It will be provided by God's Spirit. Remember what Paul said in Romans 11? The Spirit will give life to your mortal bodies. It will be a spiritual body, one given to us by the Spirit. And what we can say from this discussion here in 1 Corinthians 15 is... We know God can make bodies perfectly suited for the environment they will inhabit. 
And this body that Paul is describing, that is that is imperishable, glorious, powerful, and spiritual, is going to be tailor-made for our eternal environment. That's the exciting thing to see here in this, in this passage. All right, then over in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about our future hope of the resurrection, really beginning in 2 Corinthians 4, when he says in verse 14 that he who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and bring us uh, with you into his presence. And then going on into chapter 4, Paul uses another analogy, a clothing analogy. He says this in verse 1, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, our bodies, our mortal bodies are a tent temporary, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Remember, we are created to be embodied creatures. At death, the spirit and the body are severed. We become naked in that sense, but that's not where God intends to, to leave the story. We are going to trade out this temporary tent-like body for a building, not a tent, a building that's permanent, a glorious building that Paul says means that we will be further clothed. So an existence, a bodily existence that's as much greater as this body than a building is greater to a tent. And it will be swallowed up by life, he says in, in verse 4. All right, now um, that gets us through 1 2 Corinthians. Uh, let's move on here. Just a few more passages to go. I think my vocal cords can hold out here for just a couple of more. I love this passage in Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. From it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, go right on into the next chapter. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Now, we could draw similar points in almost all of these passages where the apostle gives a practical application. Like at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. There's always a therefore to these teachings about the future. And um, I just thought I would take the time there to read that one real quick in Philippians. Now, we've just studied First and Second Thessalonians. So this passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 should be fresh on your mind. The only additional information we get here, I mean, we've already learned <clears throat> that the resurrection will take place uh, on the last day or when Jesus returns and that it will be a transformation. The one thing that we learn in, in addition to all of that is that um, verse 15, we declare this to you by word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who've fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. And then here's another, therefore, therefore encourage one another. But what we learn here is that in the time of the resurrection, the dead in Christ will be transformed first. And then those who happen to, to be alive when the Lord comes back, will be transformed as well. And then one last passage uh, for our study tonight from 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Now, with all of those passages in mind. I hope you understand what I said at the start of the lesson in that 
Well, this is a topic that I think um, I haven't in the past really grasped as central. This is something taught, you know, over and over again in the New Testament. And there are some key summary points that we can take away from this. Number one, as you can see in these passages, it is the resurrection of Christ that is the basis of our own hope of the resurrection. It is because Christ has broken the power of death that uh, we will be that we are set free from it, and uh, it is also because of His resurrection that we have a pattern to look for, that we will be glorified like He is glorified. Secondly, the New Testament teaches that all of the dead will be raised, although most of these passages, as you have seen, focus on the resurrection of the righteous. Um, A third point to see here, and this is really important, resurrection involves both continuity and discontinuity. Resurrection involves continuity. It is this body that is going to be transformed. But it also involves discontinuity. It is this body that is to be transformed. So you ever heard the old expression, it's the same but different? Well, that's the the idea here of the resurrection. It's this body that is raised, but then it will also be transformed in a way, as Paul said, that is so glorious that it would almost be uh, that we can't imagine that the new body will, will have come from this body. And lastly, the resurrection will take place when Christ returns. So what this means is that uh, between the point of death and the point of Christ's return, we are waiting for our hope of the resurrection. I remember when Christy passed away that there were friends who said, um, you know, now that her, her battle with cancer is over, now she is whole again. Well, she will be whole someday uh, when the Lord returns. That's when she will be raised from the dead and transformed. And then she will once again be what God created her to be, an embodied creature made after his image and likeness, but a gloriously transformed embodied creature. And uh, I'm longing for that day. And I know you are too, as we all look forward to that. Now, I just wanted to take time in this lesson to trace through all of these passages in the New Testament that talk about the importance of the resurrection. Because knowing that we will be in a new glorified bodily existence means we're going to live somewhere. And it's what I want to focus on then in the rest of September. In the rest of our time together in these classes, what I want to do is carefully work through Revelation 21 and 22. Because that is the most um, exhaustive description in the New Testament of what our eternity with God will be like. And of course, as we go through that, we will be incorporating passages from elsewhere. And frankly, that part of the Bible draws upon a lot of places, particularly in the Old Testament, but we'll also make some connections with other New Testament passages as well. But I hope that you will be encouraged as we think more carefully and and more exhaustively about our hope of heaven. Well, that's what we'll move to, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Thanks for studying with me tonight, and look forward to continuing this study uh, next week.